Hi, this is Penn. Penn Gillette, Penn and Teller. Big guy does magic, smaller guy next to me. He does magic too. He doesn't talk that much. I want to talk about uh, Joseph Jaffe is not famous. And Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Joseph Jaffe is wicked not famous. Joseph Jaffe is superlatively not famous. And for good and sufficient reason. I mean, maybe his guests are famous. Maybe his guests are famous. He gets some famous people on his guests, but Joseph Jaffe himself is not famous. That's the important part. You can have famous guests and still not be famous. And if you want an example of that, well, Joseph Jaffe would be a really good example. Teller would do a better job at a talk show, and Teller doesn't talk, which you'd think would be one of the major qualifications of being on a talk show <laughs> and not being famous. What's that, Teller? Oh, yeah, Teller says, Joseph Jaffe. Not famous. Love you. This is my best kind of show notes. If you didn't touch one of them, one of them, not even one of them. I'm not sure which one is Paul Rudd and which one is Lane Green. Final card here is the, the ultimate outcome. Today is take your dog to work day. Oh, like Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Without further ado, his debut. Sweet Caroline. Everybody say hello to Sammy. Is I'm that not good? I'm just pausing so that you just are up in front of your seat. I'm so enormously flattered. Branding is not a bad blind date. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take a picture of this. No, this is agape. This is love. I really enjoyed this. You did do your homework. You asked great questions. I'm flattered. Thank you. You just, you just made my day. Look at you. You are I mean, insane. How did I do that? You're how insane. did I do that? You're insane. <laughs> I might be uh, insane, but am I uh, am I a narcissist? Uh, I'm I'm suddenly nervous. I'm suddenly thinking like everything, everything that I held to be true suddenly it's like Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Is that something that a narcissist would say when he insists on being not famous? I don't know. Uh, I I'm uh, I love the subject though. I love I love I love the subject. I love talking about today. We're going to talk about. Uh, because Anne Betts is on the show and all bets are off. Maybe that's what I'm going to call the episode. All bets are off. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about narcissism. We're going to talk about neuroscience. Hell, we might talk about neuroplasticity and imposter syndrome. That might be a bingo. Uh, it better not be. But um, in all seriousness, very, very important topics. Um, when we think about society and when we think about politics, when we think about uh, identity, when we think about, uh, and we were discussing this in the green room. Yes, we have a virtual green room here. We were discussing um, not so much confidence, but self-promotion. There is so much to discuss. Stick around, uh, enjoy the show, and uh, you might learn a thing or 20. Normally I say a thing or two, but today might be a thing uh, or 20. So because it is 2024 and uh, somehow I've been able to uh, get back to, at one point last year I was, I don't know, six or seven weeks behind. Now I'm one or two weeks, a uh, nice little bit of wiggle room and that allows me to really just manifest and, and recharge my batteries and hopefully motivate you uh, this is my why statement. As a teacher, facilitator, and coach, I help high-aspiring entrepreneurs, owners, and their leadership teams get unstuck, return to growth, and become forever changed. And, uh, you know, the get unstuck part, uh, it, it all is very, very meaningful to me. 
Uh, behind me, you see my new book, Forever Changed. Um, but the Get Unstuck, when I started the show as Corona TV, uh, March 2020, I said I was starting it for people that were stuck at home, quite literally, or stuck in general. And so how do you help someone who's stuck? Well, I guess you help them get uh, unstuck. Uh, this is the book, Forever Changed, How a Global Pandemic Changed My Direction, My Purpose, and My Life. I'm still not really talking about it uh, as much, but uh, if I'm going to talk about it to anyone, I would want to talk about it, about it to you, foreverchange.life, um, where uh, you can get a life, you can change your life, uh, you can choose life. Um, there's lots of interesting things to do uh, on the website. And uh, of course, last year in June, I started coaching with EOS, um, really helping business owners and their leadership teams, again, not just get unstuck, but get what they want from their business. And I really have enjoyed, you know, working with smaller and medium sized companies as opposed to those big fat cats that sit, those pale male and stale men uh, that uh, sit in their mahogany, uh, around their mahogany boardroom tables for their Fortune 500 companies. We need to change that. And we will. And we will. So if you like the show and if you like me, if you love me, if you really love me, that's what a narcissist might say. How about if you really hate me? I suppose maybe that's what a narcissist would say as well. That's a question for you. And thinking, I don't know, maybe, you know, love or hate, as long as you feel something for me. Um, subscribe to the show, bit.ly forward slash subscribe to the show. We also do a morning coffee. Um, I suppose a narcissist might refer to themselves as we, right? I just get lonely. I do a morning, morning coffee Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the Collective Cafe in Discord. And, uh, you know, we recently did an episode on Elon Musk. Um, and uh, I have questions. Does Anne have answers? Is every visionary a narcissist? Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, um, Donald Trump? just bingo. Um, I'm just saying just lots of names. Do you have to be a narcissist to be a visionary, to be up there, to be a leader? All these questions hopefully will be answered soon. And if you can't join live, please go ahead and subscribe to the pod, bit.ly forward slash collective cafe to go. Take your coffee, your virtual coffee with you. But now it is time for the seated soliloquy and uh, the seated soliloquy today is called The Judge. Now, I recently did a coaching program called PQ, which actually stood for positive intelligence, uh, positive intelligence quotient. We have IQ, we have EQ, and then there is this concept of PQ. And I learned all about the saboteurs and the sage. I learned about neuroplasticity. I learned about almost just understanding, almost recoding or understanding that that any stimulus or any decision point in my life is going to go down one of two pathways. Is it a dirty, you know, a dirt cobbled road filled with potholes that is uh, less traveled or least traveled? Or is it a super highway, beautifully paved? But what if the highway is the highway to hell? Uh, the highway led by the judge and the saboteurs as opposed to as opposed to the sage. So in this exercise, um, the judge leads, you know, the saboteurs is the lead saboteur. And we had to give a name to our judge. And I called my judge the narcissist. Now the judge is not meant to be a mirror of you or not or who you don't want to be. But for me, this judge, this this entity that judges me, that puts me down, that tells me I'm not good enough. Um, that uh, fills me with insecurity, imposter syndrome. Um, this is a narcissist, the narcissist. And, and I read up on what it is to be a narcissist. And, and we think, you know, we think of Icarus and we think of hubris and we think of really, really just staring at yourself and falling in love with your reflection in the mirror that you are God's gift to mankind, to humankind, um, etc. But there was one thing that I found very interesting about narcissists in general, and certainly my judge. Uh, one of them is, again, this idea of a superiority complex, that they just believe they're better than you, they're better than everyone else, that you can never, ever live up to their high standards, that you will always, always disappoint them, no matter what you do. 
and uh, and and certainly there's always truth in everything. And and I realize that even in my life, um, when you have high standards, sometimes it's very hard for people to live up to those standards. And if it's true that they can never ever do right in your eyes and are always disappointing, you are you somewhat of a narcissist. But the other one was this idea of lack of empathy. And I found that to be really, really interesting when you just don't feel for anyone, for anything, when you are dead inside, ultimately, is that, you know, something that we see in narcissists. Look, I don't have to wonder or posit anymore uh, because it is time to bring on my guest, uh, Anne Betts, and I have been looking forward to this for a long time. Anne Betts is the co-founder of and director of research and learning for The Above Leadership. I hope I pronounced that right. She's considered a true thought leader in the area of coaching, neuroscience, and also trauma. She's a prolific writer who has numerous books, runs two blogs, and writes for many coaching publications. She has written the definitive book on the neuroscience of the ICF competencies. I'm going to have to ask her what that stands for, uh, as well as a book on UI. On is that? I hope I, I pronounced that as uh, well as well. UI or UI, and consulted with ICF for many years, and was also faculty member and neuroscience consultant to the Coaches Training Institute (CTI), and teaches neuroscience to experienced coaches through her own organization, also in partnership with coaching.com. She has been a certified professional coach for over 20 years and is also a published poet using her understanding of the brain and consciousness to bring to life the wonders of the human soul. Don't you love that? The wonders of the human soul. Anne lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico with her six, yes, count them, six highly entertaining cats. And maybe I'll be her seventh entertaining cat. Uh, today, <laughs> one one of them's on the one of them's right here on the desk. So, I have seen at least one cat wandering um, wandering past. Yes, there are wandering Jews, and then there are wandering cats. There's wandering so, cats in, in my you know. in my house. There's always some fur around. Okay, so you know, as long as we don't get stuck with a fur ball, uh, let me let Good. me ask you. So, first of all, did I pronounce? Did I? Is it is it U Y Ui? What did, are you was reading? That a typo? I'm not sure what the. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're referring to. You, maybe it's a typo. Maybe it might have been as well as uh, as well as a book on, and I just had you why. So oh, it, um, must it must be a typo. Sorry. All right. So, I, all right, but you can tell me what is ICF. The International Coach Federation, and they are the main accreditation body for coaching and they have uh, ethical standards and competencies for coaching. They're international and they're not the only accrediting body, but they're the biggest. So now I've, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to start working towards that. I, I became, I became a coach. So I, I, w I want to talk to you about just the coaching part for a second. Sure. We'll, we'll jump around, uh, jump around. I'm sure. Um, I became a coach. Um, coaching this system called the Entrepreneurial Operating System in June of last year. And I must admit, talk about imposter syndrome. You know, I came in with so much fear and trepidation and insecurity uh, about being a coach, about, well, what do I know? And, you know, I, I'd mentored, I'd, I'd facilitated, I'd keynoted, I, I'd teach at NYU, but I'd never coached. Um, and, uh, and, and I remember being given advice uh, from other coaches, more experienced coaches, I guess, saying, uh, on one hand, you know more than they do. So like if you're armed with the fact that that whilst you may not believe you know the material as well as you should or could because it is your first go round, you still know more than than they do. And so I, I'm still struggling to grow into this role. I feel like it is a massive responsibility um, to be a coach, but am I putting too much on my shoulders? Am I am I too hard on myself? I would say, Joseph, it depends on how you're looking at coaching, you know, um, because what I'm hearing a little bit in the background is you're looking at coaching as sort of maybe with a little crossover in terms of consulting when you and I don't I'm trying know. to resist the urge, by the way. OK, because... so, you know, the classic way that I think about coaching that is in alignment with this governing body. It's not the only way, but it's what they give 
a credential for is this view that the client is naturally creative, resourceful, and whole, which comes from the work originally of Carl Rogers mm. in the 70s. And it's really this view that the client has their own answers. And our job is to hold a certain space where they find them. And that can be hard. That actually takes some training and supervision. And it is the hardest thing, actually, for people to sort of unlearn when they're becoming a coach and really figure out how do I hold this space for a, you know, for a client where they find their own answers and it's not about my expertise. And that, that is harder than it sounds. And I'm sure you've experienced that, like holding back and just bringing them forth and creating the space where they come forth is mm. harder than it sounds. I absolutely love the way that, and and I am, you know, I'm jotting down um, that quote right now because that was part of the training, right? Which is ninety percent of the time, the answer is in the room, and 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 your role as a teacher, facilitator, and a coach is to facilitate those different answers into a some kind of a unified or consensus. Um, but I love that, and and one of the things, you know. You spoke about all, uh, this gets into neuroplasticity, which is you have to unlearn your bad habits. You yeah. have to you have to bite your tongue, bite your lip, um, in terms of being able to say, ooh, 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 ooh. you know, I, you <laughs> know, me, pick my, me, I know the answer. But what totally, if you're wrong? What if you're one wrong? Of, one of my students once said to me, "I love this line." She said, "Oh, I want the light bulb to go off in their head, not mine. Mm. That's what's critical." You want the neural connections to be happening over there. You are sitting back. You're not stressed by the issue. You don't have a great stake in the outcome. Usually, if you do have a stake in the outcome, you know you probably shouldn't be coaching that person, not in the cleanest sense of the world word, right? So you want the aha moment to happen over there because they can then work with that. If you've got it all figured out over here, it then goes into their brain in a sort of a secondary way, and it may not fire and create the neural pathways. You know, you were talking about the ahas that you had about the judge, and you know, that's, it's so much more useful that you go, oh, I do that, than somebody who says, hey, Joseph, you do this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, like or, or, already today, you know, in my next session, when I end sessions, I always talk about a, something that was surprising or a, or an insight. From now on, and I'm going to call it the uh, I'm going to call it the Ann Betts light bulb moment. <laughs> I, I'm actually going to refer to it specifically. And I also like this idea of when we think about neural pathways and we think about synapses and we think about the fact that ultimately the brain is this series of electrical charges and impulses. Electrical it, and chemical, both. So, and yes. it, But it makes sense that something should be able to connect and a light or a light bulb moment sitting above the head, right, or, or inside. It just makes sense for all those reasons. Yeah, and it's such a delight as a coach when you watch your client have that light bulb moment because you've set up the the circum the context or ask the question that generates that, and they're doing that work internally. It's so great. And I'm think just if you're making me think early in my career, I had the blessing to work in a coaching program for Cargill, which is a vertically integrated, privately mm. held company, big company um, based in Minnesota, which is where I was at the time. What's relevant about that is that they would give me all these clients like I coached a guy that was researching shrimp. I coached a guy who worked under Lake Michigan, I think it was, in the salt mines, which was super fun because then we could always say back to the salt mines. And I really love that I could use that literally at one point in my life. So I coached all the coach people who worked with animal, you know, animal nutrition, all of this. And what that really showed me at that point in my life, that's about 20 years ago when I was first starting out as a coach, it really showed me I did not need to know the context of their work because I wasn't coaching that. I was coaching the human. They knew what it meant to be a shrimp farmer. They knew that. 
And I just had to ask the questions that would help them have those aha light bulb moments. Because if I needed to know everything about there, I never could have coached for Cargill. They were way too diversified. You know, good luck finding a coach who has experience as a shrimp researcher. <laughs> exactly. Well, We're I, working I, in I, the salt mines. I want to. I want to know. <laughs> have you have you actually not seen my LinkedIn bio that says you know shrimp researching? <laughs> Ninja. <laughs> salt Ninja. miner, former yeah. salt miner, listen, you know. Listen, um, I'd, ra I'd, I'd, I'd rather work in the salt mines than be the canary in the coal mine. So there totally. you go. Um, let's let's talk about leadership because okay. you know, I've had so many people. I've had over 600 guests on the show. And, uh, you know, and, and the one and so many talk about leadership. Leadership is, you know, and, and there's servant leadership and humble leadership. And, you know, and there's so many ways we could go. And I just I, my mind goes back to Tom Peters, who said a leader's job is to create more leaders. Um, I'd like to hear from you. First of all, what is your definition of a leader or leadership? And then we can talk about the neuroscience associated with leadership. Well, so. Um, I don't have a good soundbite definition of leadership, but what I look to is I'm actually a big fan of a particular study that was done by my colleague Richard Boyatzis at Case Western Reserve. And I think it's called Resonant Leaders or Resonant Leadership. And what he did is, and I'm probably going to oversimplify this, and I may even not be totally accurate, but let me give you what my memory is. What he did is he looked at the sort of um, impact that leaders had on their team. Because to me, we can look at the leader all day long. Let's look at where the rubber meets the road. And what he found, again, this is an oversimplification, but leaders who created what he calls a positive emotional attractor state, which sounds good, right? It's a toward mm. state. It's their team is open, their brains are in a particular pattern. It's not one area, but a particular pattern he calls PEA, positive emotional attractor. And basically you get more creativity, you get emotional openness, you get a team who's like, yes. And then you have the negative emotional attractor state, which is more like, you know, they're shut down. They're not emotionally open. They may even be emotionally activated in a negative way. They're not, and you don't get stuff going on in the brain that's linked to like creativity and learning and all of those things. Okay. That to me, a leader is someone who creates a positive emotional attractor state in the team that they're working with. One of them, I'll give you one more little soundbite on this, Joseph, is that one of the things that Richard found is that, and it wasn't the only thing, but one critical thing was that leaders who did that tended to be more, you would see more dual firing. So you would see a more integrated, able to access some of the things in the right hemisphere that are critical and able to access some of the things in the left hemisphere. So it wasn't just the anything goes leader. I love you, you know, wonderful. And it wasn't just the, you know, let's get, let's narrow things down. And I don't care about the people. It was the ones who had this really good balance. If I can say one more thing about that, I have asked people around the world, tell me about your leader that you would follow through fire. Tell me about the person you would work with again. And inevitably they say they were good at people and good at task. I don't want to follow someone who's only good at one of those. And I think Boyatz, Richard Boyatz's research really helps us see that from a brain scanning. So that's my definition, a leader that is integrated and creates a positive emotional attractor state in the people they're working with. That's a leader to me. I, I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the, uh, the air horn for that one. Um, and I can relate, I can relate to, <laughs> I can relate to, you know, to what uh, Lencioni refers to as healthy and smart EQ, IQ, what yep. I've now been trained on is PQ. Uh, yeah. If you want to kind of create a third leg um, of this tripod um, in, a, in a sense. And um, and there's definitely, and, and there's, I think, respect um, that is earned as opposed to commanded. 
but let's 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 go all the way now to to the uh the i don't know if i want to call it the accidental leader or the the reluctant leader someone who's being thrown into or thrust into or elevated into the imposter syndrome um how how do you teach how do you teach confidence how do you allow a leader to grow into themselves um, and, and and we'll kind of hold off on the narcissism conversation for a moment. Sort of different ends of the spectrum. You know, I, I the reluctant leader, the, you know, often the reluctant leaders are the ones with really good people skills, you know, <laughs> they're like, but wait, but I don't want to have to do everything it seems that I need to do in this organization in order to lead. And that can be a real systemic issue. So um, helping people develop confidence, you know, and I look at this in a couple of ways, just wrote an article about imposter syndrome, and I'm trying to remember everything I said in the article, um, but I look at it in a couple of ways. Is it really, is it really personal doubt? Is it really that I'm not sure, you know, and I share the story in the article, the very first time I went out and spoke about neuroscience there was a little part of me that was going, are the neuroscience police going to show, am I going to get arrested for this? Right. Something. And I, you know, like not literally, but emotionally. Right. There's a thing called the neuroscience police. There is. And they come and watch you when you're talking. Are you know, MPs, wish... They're not MPs, you know, watch out <laughs> no. for the MPs. I, the NPs. I wish there were, because a lot of people are saying a lot of stuff in neuroscience. is not right. So I kind of wish there were, but there wasn't. And again, it goes back to something you said, which is I actually did know more than my audience. And, you know, that kind of imposter, if you do the work, you get good feedback and you study and you do the work and you practice, you create the neuroplasticity. And, you know, I started teaching neuroscience 12 years ago, something like that, 13 years ago, because I wanted to understand it better. And so I don't have imposter syndrome around that anymore because that aspect of it just required practice, reflection, feedback, study. Now, there's another aspect where it's actually coming out of a toxic system, mm -hmm. and that is the I'm being told externally, you know, my ideas have no value or, you know, what made you think you could do that or people stealing my ideas or getting thrown under the bus. And this is something that there was a, there have been some good articles, particularly for women of color saying, you're being told you have imposter syndrome. You are being manipulated by a toxic system and it isn't you. And I think it's really critical in building confidence is, is it the system telling me that I'm full of nonsense or is it really that I do need to learn and grow and develop? Does, Joseph, does that make sense? That distinction? No, it's, it's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to process this as well. So it's almost like gas, it's gaslighting. You, it, it's, it's gaslighting. I mean, this Indeed. is, and it's, and it is therefore systemic if it is coming from the system at a, you know, at a, at a consistent level. And, and it's it can, it quite, can really quite distressing. Yeah, it's really destabilizing and it's hard. And, it, and it, if it's in a, it can happen in a workplace system. You know, who do you think you are? And, you know, and because people are threat, maybe threatened, trying to keep you down. It can also happen in a home environment where you're trying to develop something new and the impact that you get at home, maybe from spouse or parents, is either lack of interest, oh, okay, yeah, great, or outright contempt for what you're doing. And that can also be you know, really destabilizing and cause a lot of self doubt. I had a, so I can share a personal example. I was um, in a relationship with someone who I later sort of figured, this is how I got into all of this was in like seven years ago. Um, like, how did I start studying narcissism? I was with one. And boy, I tell you, the, the blessing of having actually been with a narcissist is you understand it. So one of the things he, he was very, contemptuous of my work in neuroscience. And so he would sort of be like, oh, 
he remember he said to me once, like, it seems like it's really important for you to understand everything. And, and it was about that tone. Like, it's really important. I used to be like that, but you know, I've sort of evolved past that. Oh, that's the, that's the superiority, right? The, yeah. And I could talk about where that comes from, but it was like, you know, the result was I didn't want to share anything with him. I started like in, I was in this crazy cognitive dissonance where I would go out and I would be speaking and training in public and people were like, Hey, I really like what you're saying. And then I would go home and be met with this lack, complete lack of oh, like change the subject or contempt like that one. And I would think what's going on? You know, am I missing something? And that is ultimately, you know, I, I ended it reasonably quickly, but it was a mind F you, you know what, while it was going on because I was bonded with him. He was my partner. I wanted to listen and take seriously what he was saying. You know, it wasn't just a troll on LinkedIn. It, it was, you know, so I'm trying to get around his view when really it was coming from him being threatened. So we can talk a little about the superiority because I got a, there's a layer there. Um. <laughs> does, I mean, I have a quick question on yeah, that. Yeah, please. Does, does, a, does superior, a superiority complex, is it, is it inherently connected to uh, a degree of insecurity? Are these two kind of like joined at the hip? Yeah, it's not. See, because people who really, and I'm, I think I'm going to be preaching to the choir, Joseph. I don't think this is anything that you don't know, but let me articulate it. People who feel confident in what they're doing don't need to prove it. And they're very happy to admit where they don't know something. You know, that's not an issue for them. To, you know, if somebody asks a question and you're like, Oh, I never really thought about that. I don't know. We should probably look that up. That is a confident person. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're making me think of, I'm going to go just down a little rabbit hole. There was a research study once that said, who comes across most like confident? And they put a bunch of guys out there in blue suits and they had one guy wear red tennis shoes. And the red tennis shoe guy was voted as the most confident because he was so confident he could wear red tennis shoes. Mm. And it's the, I have to prove my superiority that comes from a deep and un generally unseen and unknown deep wound generally of shame. And this is why if you call them out, they can get so nasty. They don't want anybody to see that underneath it all, they feel small, ineffective, and, you know, broken. But they don't necessarily get that themselves. It's like the iceberg under the water. But yeah, people who really are confident don't need to take other people down. But enough about Donald Trump. Let's talk about... <laughs> <laughs> but let, I, I couldn't resist. I, you couldn't, got, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't resist. We'll give you that one. <laughs> Let's go back to the red tennis shoes for okay. a moment. <laughs> what, about, what about the person... Um, and, and this is this is probably the irony of it that is so insecure that they feel that they're trying so hard to impress and break through and stand out. So they wear red tennis shoes and now they're perceived uh, maybe inaccurately as the most confident and they're the least confident. But there are some people that really do go out of their way. Well, maybe to, if they to read try this, and... yeah, maybe if they read the study in my experience in, you know, walking in the world and being in this world of human development for 20 years, they don't wear the red tennis shoes because they're afraid of being laughed at. They're looking around them to see what do the people in power wear? How can I mimic that? If I get the right external stuff, people will think of me. They don't, the red tennis shoes is sort of a way of saying, I'm going to let my freak flag fly. I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to trust that I am enough. I don't need to, you know, wear the Gucci shoes because I think that is more what the person who's insecure is trying to do. It's like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to be so perfect that you will believe that I am, you know, amazing. Well, I, I love the conversation because we're getting into the realm of promotion or even self-promotion. But I yeah. want to just, I just want to uh, touch on that point that you made, because I think it's so important, which is, you know, it's like 
It's like, don't tell people you're smart, be smart. Don't tell people you're confident, be confident. And, and, and that is the ultimate level of, I think, security, which is you don't have to protest and keep reminding people. Now, I'll tell you, I'll give you, I'll give you a personal anecdote as well, which is I will find sometimes that I'm trying to impress my own family, my kids, my wife, to tell people I'm kind of a big deal because outside of these four walls, people actually think that, but inside I'm like a schmuck, you know, I'm like an imbecile. And so I can see that there is like an insecurity of being able to say, you know what, I'm actually, I, you know, I actually kind of wrote a few books. Like I've done a few things. Have you ever watched my show? Um, but I understand it just comes from just wanting to be accepted and, and who better to accept you than your children and your wife? You know, you make me think of that Mark Twain quote about, I think when I was a teenager, my father was the stupidest man on earth. And then by the time I was 30, it was amazing how much he had learned. Right. <laughs> so I think you are battling this whole kid, you know, differentiation. And I have a 27 year old. And he definitely went through a period where I had nothing to offer. And now, you know, he's a PhD student and now we have really good conversations and he's interested to some degree in my take. But I think it was just, that was just maturity. And, I, I know. absolutely love that quote. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I got a quote for you too, because I always find a quote for my guests. This was today's quote. Um, the act of founding a company is its mm. own act of narcissism. Yeah. I alone can do this. I love this. I love this quote. And it comes from now I figured out I got to try it? and get him on the show. It's Andy Dunn, who's oh, the okay. former CEO of Bonobos. And uh, so now I've got to get him on the show because he's a very interesting. Uh, he, he, he actually, I just saw one of his recent uh, tweets, if we can even call it that. Um, is for, what are for two X's. What are, X's? what are we calling yeah. now? X's. Like, Talk X's. about narcissists. You know, Talk, well, I don't go po political. People get mad at me when I go political, but we could talk about Elon Musk. Let's, oh, let's talk about, me. let's talk about him next. But, but by the way, by the way, so what Andy's doing, which I think is amazing is to battle this uh, epidemic of loneliness is anybody who wants a birthday party sponsored. I think he's going to sponsor a birthday party for them and help put a birthday party together <laughs> to kind of, so I just thought that was, reach that was out beautiful. To him. It's my birthday in February. I need to reach out and see if he'll give me a birthday party. If he invites me, I'm coming too. That's um, awesome. Is, is it, is it in fact narcissistic to, to start a company uh, or is he just being a little provocative? Well, I think it's, I think he probably meant it to be provocative. And I think like everything, there is truth in it. And, um, but I would say it depends on where you honestly are coming from, honestly, because there are narcissists who found companies to do good, but really it's about getting attention. I've known a few of these. I know a guy in Santa Fe who's like that, and I had to just block him because he just started irritating me. But, you know, it's all about we're trying to do good and look at me. And we call that a communal narcissist. They get their jollies from you know, being seen as being this very benevolent person. Um, and it's a, it can be a type of narcissism. Not everybody who is motivated by benevolence is a narcissist. And I will go political for a minute here because he's not our president anymore. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter scores very low on the narcissism, not totally without it. But, you know, if, as I've seen sort of rankings of presidents, they all tend to score somewhere on the narcissism scale. And as I recall, Jimmy Carter was one of the lower ones. And he doesn't, you know, it's, there wasn't a lot of fanfare about, you know, he just goes and builds houses for Habitat for Humanity because that's what he was motivated to do, not to get attention. From what I could see from the outside, it can be very hard to tell. So um, does it, yeah, does that, I mean, I am not didn't answer the question, I think. Maybe. No, I think I, why I think it's interesting, and let's go back to beyond the provocation, is the fact that that uh, here here's here's the fo the follow up question: is an is there an acceptable level of narcissism that in fact can be healthy, and and, and at that level, and if managed, and you know, and and almost coached 
Can you coach? There are too many questions. Can you coach narcissism? Should you coach narcissism? <laughs> you know, should you should you you know extinguish it? Uh, um. So, uh, so so I guess my question is: Is there an acceptable level of narcissism? that in fact can be healthy? That is my question. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I see, and for me, and I believe language matters, I don't think, so my answer is if it's really narcissism, it's like saying, is there an acceptable amount of cyanide that's really helpful for people? You know, like, no. Narcissism equals cyanide. Well, when you put it that way. <laughs> it's it's really toxic. It's like, I think of the narcissist in the organization, I call them spoiled meat in the stew. Mm. And then what I say, Joseph, and I want to finish answering that question, but one of the things I say is most organizational development is trying to make the carrots happy in a toxic stew. And what they actually need to get rid of is what is poisoning the stew because the carrots generally are fine. So is there, an, no, I think it's different. And we throw the word around. If I am proud of myself genuinely and I, and you know, you've published books and I say, I just did this thing. I just, um, published a book and, and it was a lot of work and I'm really proud of it. That's not narcissistic. That's justifiable pride. I would rather see that in a clean way. And I could talk about what I mean by that. than somebody who's like, oh yeah, it was no big deal. No, come on, take some space. But that's not narcissism because you're not trying to put anyone else down. Now, if you go out there and you say, I wrote this book, it is the only book that you ever need to read. And I am the smartest man in the world because I wrote this book and everybody else who has ever written a book on this topic is an idiot. Yeah, then you're a narcissist. <laughs> I, I, I'm seeing a beautiful almost rubric or litmus test here, which is this idea of of um, whether it's confidence, whether it's self-promotion, whether it's pride, it when it comes at the expense of others, it's narcissism. It's yeah. it's a, it's the zero sumness of it, right? If my if my pride, if my happiness, if my promotion, if my joy comes at the expense of another human or individual, um, you're you're <laughs> welcome to. I almost feel like you. Can I make a suggestion? Your new book should be called Toxic Stew. You know, Toxic how to get stew. I should probably write that. How to you know, how to get rid of narcissists in corporate America and 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 Congress. I will in Congress too, and 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 every leadership around the world. We're looking at you know we see this. You know, I had someone approach me to had heard about my work, wanted me to come in and do some team building, because I'm have learned my lesson. I get on the phone with this person beforehand to find out what's going on. And I ended up saying, I'm not doing it because you need to get you, what you're telling me is you need to get rid of this person. Once you have gotten rid of them, who is displaying highly narcissistic traits, I'm not diagnosing them. I'm telling you, this is narcissistic. It's a description, not a diagnosis. Once, if I come in and do team building with you, it's going to have two results. One is, no, it's not going to change anything because this person is not going to allow that. They may even derail the process. And your people may even get more angry because now they have devoted time and effort and have had their hopes up only to have no change because it can't change. And I can't team build around someone who is a broken human being playing that out in an organizational way. And what was interesting is when I said that to this leader, that they said, yeah, I know. I said, you call me when they're gone. I will come in and help process and help you with the healing and the, you know, sort of how do you come back from that and what needs to be said and where do we go from here when, when it's clean, but I can't team build around a narcissist and I don't want to, that's not fun for me. <laughs> I was almost, you know, we, we were discussing in the green room. Uh, I learned, I learned a lot. I've learned so much. I have to share this with everyone. We learned about the gold water rule. Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, not prematurely uh, diagnosing 
uh, or at least, uh, or, or um, uh, labeling someone as a narcissist or as anything before you've diagnosed them. Uh, we also learned about the McNaughton, <laughs> McNaughton rule, which McNaughton. is about the, uh, McNaughton, which is which is about criminally insane. And 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 I was almost thinking, you you know, if you if uh, you know, there's client, there's client, um, you know, attorney client or or therapist client. Um, privilege and but but if you know someone's committed a crime, you know, for example, you are obliged to report it. I'm wondering, should there be one for narcissism? If you can, if you if you find that your client is a narcissist or or there are certain traits that can be so unhealthy, should you have almost a responsibility to report them? <laughs> well, and they call that the Betts law. The oh Betts my god, law. no, I mean, I that is like such a can of worms here. So, <laughs> no. um. So there's a couple of things that I just want to say. One is I'll that, ask the tough questions. Yeah. Let me think about that. So one is that you can have narcissistic traits and not be diagnosable as, and the diagnosis would be narcissistic personality disorder. And you can have sort of, you know, like uh, some narcissistic traits. So there's, to me, there's a difference between describing that as a narcissistic thing to do versus saying this person is, you know, a full-blown nar narcissist. Um, so it's a descriptive, it's a personality trait. Um, and there is that. Uh, I, the other thing I want to say, and this is an interesting, I had to learn a new word and maybe you know this, or I might teach it to you because I did not know it, know it. Narcissist. So if you have if you've got a client, you know, clients who have like depression, um, things like that, they tend to seek help because it doesn't feel good to be depressed generally. So it feels like I'm not myself. This isn't who I am or, you know, something like OCD or something like that it doesn't feel good. And so they will be more likely to seek treatment. They'll be more likely to be available for research studies. Do you have depression? Come and help us do, you know, test this new thing. People who have high trait narcissism or even narcissistic personality disorder, and I think of it as a continuum, you know, how much are they doing? They don't tend to see that they've got a problem. They don't experience an issue. Everyone around them is a problem. So the word that I was good, that I had to learn is this word called ego syntonic or ego dystonic. So it is an ego syntonic disorder. In other words, not disruptive to their ego. Ego dystonic is something it's like, I don't feel like myself. This isn't right. I want to fix it. I don't like having OCD. I don't like the fact that I have to wash my, you know, like, can you help me? Whereas narcissism, it's like, I don't know what's wrong with all of these people. They just won't do what I say. And I know, I know best um, that, that sort of superiority mm. icing on the broken cake. That's, that's such a, it's such a clear way for people to actually almost self-diagnose that or, or recognize those traits. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it, it, it comes down, it comes down to, again, being a founder or starting a company you know, not being open to feedback, to, to advice, you know, well, you know, everything, you, you're all wrong. I'm right. You know, I alone can fix this. I mean, and, and, and the founder, the entrepreneur that is open to feedback that accepts the fact that as, you know, I say to founders all the time, you might be the greatest, you know, this might be the greatest idea ever created, but can it be better? Can you, can somebody help you take it further? The answer has to be always yes. Absolutely. You, it has to you know, be. and this is why I get so, you know, want to know what makes me mad. I, I do. Really, really tweaked when people are like, but look at what a genius they are. And I'm going to say Steve Jobs, for example, who was notorious. Now, some people say he got better toward the end of his life. I don't know. But at some point in his life, he was notorious for yelling at engineers, for being very aggressive and just yelling. And how can you be so stupid and like that? And so I'm thinking what I know about the brain when we get yelled at, boy, we get flooded with neurotransmitters. Our body gets flooded with hormones. One of the, one of the ways these, these are desired is to 
these are designed is to make it harder to think. And it's probably gonna, um, I have, I have, I know someone who worked at Microsoft and said, you know, she got yelled at by Bill Gates and, you know, felt like the stupidest person in the world. And I asked her how long it took to recover. She said, I was useless the rest of the day, probably the rest of the week. Because that's what's happening with all of this is getting yelled at is this threat and our body is just trying to survive. So my point being, I'm an engineer. I go in to see Steve Jobs. Maybe I'm wrong, but now I've been yelled at and made to feel like I'm this small. Where's all my creativity going? He's not the only creative person in the organization. That is not how it works. And so what happened? What got lost? What got lost? Because this narcissistic personality was promoted and excused and allowed to give full reign to whatever, you know, triggers they had. What got lost? Maybe we would have solved global warming if people hadn't been yelled at. <laughs> like, wow, it's, it's, I do not accept that as an excuse. It makes me so mad. You know, you're just the one who wants the most attention. You're not necessarily the smartest person in the organization. You have a stronger drive potentially for attention. And speaking of Elon <laughs> Musk, but uh, you know, <laughs> and, but but you, but you know, so so I, I I'd like to talk about. Um, Steve Jobs versus Elon Musk or, or or what you're seeing, what you're observing with Elon Musk right now. Um, I will I will set up uh, I will set it up the following way to close on Steve Jobs because there are people and sometimes even myself that have almost given him permission to have been an arsehole um, because he was Steve Jobs. He's a visionary. That's what visionaries do. Uh -oh. You know, so so I, I'm I'm opening the door to kind of say, but you know what? how much better could he have been and what could he have solved? And then you've got Elon Musk. And, and, and the argument with Elon Musk is, does he know what he's doing and does he care? And the answer is no and no. Or does he know exactly what he's doing and should we care? And the answer might be yes and yes, question mark. I would love to get your professional take on, on what we're witnessing right now with this, this phenomenon called Elon Musk. And then maybe just come back to comparisons with Steve Jobs? Well, I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything that others haven't said way, way better than me. And this is not necessarily my area of expertise, but he is a classic example of taking credit for things that he does not deserve credit for. And, you know, being, you know, less of a person that's really done anything and just a really good marketer. And so most people believe he's created all of this stuff, whereas the people that really created it, nobody knows their names. So, you know, he's really good at that. I think a little difference because I think Steve Jobs actually had more uh, real, you know, engineering ability. And I don't think Elon Musk is building it on top of anything. However, the idea, and this goes back to what I was saying before, the idea that we excuse anyone, I'm mm. over that because- No excuses. Uh, there is no, and this is why narcissism thrives is people are like, yeah, he's a little tough, but he's a genius. And like, no, you're missing the contribution. And I don't want to start the gender wars, but maybe we'll go there for a moment. So there, so, so you were talking about the old, you know, the pale males around the, around pale the, male and stale, pale male and stale around this the mahogany guy. table. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not saying women in general are better. I'm saying there is a sort of what we've think thought of as a traditionally a masculine way of leading and a more feminine way of leading right. or, and I, you know, when I think about, it, I founded a company, but I founded it with my best friend and we have been business partners for over 20 years. And she is such a good, you know, think about an outrigger canoe. We're like an outrigger to each other. We keep each other, you know, we, boy, I tell you, we keep each other honest. We keep each other humble. We keep each other going. We keep each other. We don't have a mission statement. We have guiding principles of how we do our work. And the worst thing, you know, maybe 
<laughs> if, it, if you come out of the word work, then you can deal with it. But the worst thing somebody could say to me is that I did something out of integrity or our business did something out of integrity or that we were un unfair. And there are times where we have to enforce policies, but we try to be kind, humane, and fair, but we also try to be kind to ourselves, you know? So we have a policy that we don't give back, you know, the, the deposit, for example, but we'll roll it over and somebody can take another class if this one doesn't work. But we've had to do that in order to protect our own self and, and really find that integration. But we always try to operate with kindness. And she has been my, we've been each other's outrigger on that. Some of these people that found companies, and it can be men or women, I'm not talking about you know, women always do a better job. Men always do a bad job. I don't mean it like that. But when you are the solo one and, you know, promoting yourself, you're operating without an outrigger. And a lot of times the people around you, you've surrounded your, these people have surrounded themselves with yes people who will not challenge. My partner will challenge, is feels free. She is absolutely fine with challenging some of my crazy ideas or I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Ex I, I was, I wasn't sure where you were going. And I think you've brought it home in, in the most uh, powerful way, which is the concept of the outrigger. Elon Musk does not have an outrigger. There is no one controlling him or keeping him in check. Sure. Um, yep. You know, when I was teaching strategic communications at NYU, um, we spoke about the case study as in, can you imagine being in charge of comms for Elon? Good luck. It's just like, it's the run no, of this chip. Would, and you know, I'd, I'd be, I'd be very curious to look at, I'm not going to do it, but I'd be very interested to see turnover and also stress related health issues, because I think it would be so unfun and you know, challenging that I would bet, I could be wrong, but I man bets. So I might say I bet. I would bet that, 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 that those positions have higher turnover and that you also have health issues. There's a great book, one of my favorite books, not as well known as it should be. I don't know if you've ever come across it. Stanford business professor, Jeffrey Pfeffer, and his name is P.F. E-F-F-E-R. He wrote a book called Dying for a Paycheck. And it is brilliant because it's written from a business professor, financial analysis perspective, and it's the real cost of toxic workplaces. want to tell you one other thing from, from Dr. Pfeffer, from Jeffrey. I saw an interview with him where they asked him, what did you, what were the surprises when you were writing your book? And he said, two surprises. Number one, it's way worse than I thought. It's way worse. It's hard to find healthy organizations. Number two, nobody cared. Even when he could make the business pitch for better financial returns, we're not just talking happy little, everybody's happy, happy little minions. We're not just talking about that. We're talking, you will make more money if you stop being toxic, if you have better policies. You will make more money. The proof is there. Nobody cared. But why? because they're locked in a cognitive bias that supports the behavior they enjoy displaying. So reinforcing stereotypes, reinforcing fiefdoms, you know, reinforcing these, these moats or yeah. these walls that we build to protect us from our own worst enemy, which is oftentimes ourselves. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's, I think that's great. Okay. So I, I, I didn't want to, but now that, but well, maybe I did want to, and um, I want to talk. I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about Donald Trump for a reason, uh, okay. quickly. Yeah. Because instead of, um, I, I actually said, I, I said this yesterday. I said I, I actually feel depressed. I feel this heaviness when I see Iowa caucus fifty one percent whatever That's just record. Republicans though. That's it's, just Republicans. <laughs> but 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 but. <laughs> the depression I feel is, is it's an interesting angle. I was debating it with my daughter um, who's 22 is, is that it's, it's not about Trump. It's about the people that are voting for him. And I think what is going on here with everything going on with all of these allegations that enough yeah. 
people would vote for him. Forget about, you know, like, how do you, def I could ask you, how do you defeat, how do you, you know, how do you treat or defeat a narcissist? Um, I'm going to rather ask you this question, which is why are people attracted yeah. to narcissists? Here's, um, so in, so I think I do have an answer to that. Um, at least part of an answer. So, um, part of it comes from the research on cults. And we might say there's sort of a cult around Donald Trump. And one of the re things they find, and as I've been trying to study trauma and go deeper into this and even look at all of this from a neuroscience perspective, it has led me to also wanting to understand cults better because all cults are run by narcissists. So the reason, one of the reasons, it's not the only one, but one of the reasons is they feel uncertain and somebody who's very, very certain is really, it's like finding that stable ship in a rocking sea. And I think, and so both, you know, cult leaders and people like that like to foment instability you know, get the sea all riled up and then, you know, be the like one safe haven, safe harbor. Yeah. And kind of be like, I'm the rock and I have the answer. And it's just this relief of saying somebody's got the answer because I don't have it and I don't know how to find it. And this person is so sure and they're not, you see no flicker of self-doubt because they're very good at that I think they believe their own lies. So they're very convincing. And it looks like I don't have to figure out the way forward in this very messy world. I don't know what's right or wrong. Is it right that we, that, that there are trans people? Is it wrong? You know, what all, I don't know. I don't know how to sort that through. I don't know how to critically think about it. So I'm just going to follow you because you have it figured out. And I so think that's a big Appeal. It's the supreme confidence, the unwavering confidence. It's it's the pathological Projected confidence, you know, and underneath it. pathological, but it's also absolute. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. There is no humility by definition. Even imposter syndrome would say the doubt, but there's yeah. no doubt. There's no, no doubt. doubt. There's no doubt. And if I don't know that doubt and complexity and paradox is part of the human existence. And I haven't been trained in school to critically think, you know, not to be told what to think, but how to think. If that's not part of, you know, how, you know, my family, my culture, and I am left with all of these things I don't know what to think about, I'm just going to find somebody to follow. And if I can link that to sort of eternal damnation and all of this, then even better. You know, if I follow this, I'll be saved. You know, that's the right way. I don't no longer have to use mental energy in a way that I don't know how to do to, I don't have to expend any mental energy on it. I so want to combat that. How <laughs> do we? <laughs> well, you know, t take, take the air out, you know, just to stop giving, uh, uh, quite frankly, air in the sails, air time and... Uh... Stop giving him, you know, this is what, so George Lakoff, who is a brilliant linguist scholar, brilliant, is one of the most brilliant humans of our time, George Lakoff and his co collaborators who are not as well known. So who knows why that is? Basically, that's what he said during the first election cycle with Trump, you know, so many years ago, he said, don't give him attention. Don't, you know, don't re-empower his language. Build, and that's what I would say is, rather than trying to address the negativity, build the, build the positivity, build the way forward, mm. build the hope, build the, build that and show people the path to do that. I'm not a political strategist for obvious reasons. <laughs> well, so, I think, I mean, I think everyone was saying it. Um, and they couldn't, but the networks couldn't do it because again, it's, you know, it's, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. Um, and I, 
I want to ask you, I want to sneak in just one final question. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I just, I could talk to you for hours and please come back any. Absolutely. Any, this is any, so fun. So fun. Anytime. I, I love the, I love the subject. I also want to make sure people know, uh, but, uh, but now I know your name. Um, uh, tell us, well, I, I, I want you to tell us about, uh, uh about, um, some of the work you're doing and about, uh, about the blog. Um, but, um, we were discussing AI. And uh, and and you came up with a brilliant uh, phrase called manipulative empathy uh, as well. And uh, so I just I you know there is certainly manipulation. I, I guess my question is, what do you think about AI? And and is it possible for AI? Is AI naturally narcissistic? What's going on? Well, Can you train an AI to not I, be you know, the, and I've been hearing that there's you know some training around AI to you know like um in in my world in the co in our world in the coaching world you know to you know you could have ai ask you these you know very sophisticated powerful questions and then there's now this you know additional sort of putting into the system like empathy oh that sounds really you know your ai your your siri or whoever it is is saying oh it sounds really hard for you <laughs> but here is the thing human beings so empathy, and you may know this, so stop me if you've heard this one, but human beings, not AI, have two ways that we, there's many ways, but two big ways we access empathy, cognitive and affective. So cognitive empathy is if, if I, you know, if I tell you about the, you know, when I was telling you about the narcissist who told me, oh, I used to try to figure everything out, you know, cognitive empathy says, God, I, I can understand cognitively. I can understand and how that would make you feel like I can kind of get my head around that. Effective empathy is if you actually can feel a little, ugh, when I say it, do you feel it in your body? Is there a ghost of a feeling? It's like if, if your daughter comes to you and says, I just slammed my fingers in the car door. The natural human response for normal humans is to go, <sighs> why do we go, <sighs> because we feel it. Why did my thumb just go down? <laughs> that, was know, that, was, that was weird. That was really weird. I want to see. If my thumb went down because I was doing this, I don't know why. But how did that even? I don't even know what happened there. That it's it's flipping the AI, but carry it's on. the AI is trying to try new and to see, and they got it wrong. So you cannot yes. program effective empathy. You don't get effective felt empathy without a body. And so there's no. And so I think about this great line from one of my teachers. I don't mean to. I'll just say his name. I don't mean to give a lot of names. It can get annoying, but his name is Dan Siegel. Again, a brilliant man in this time in the world, Dr. Dan Siegel. And he said this really interesting line that a young woman, he's a therapist, um, and young woman said, you know, Dan, with other therapists, I have felt heard. With you, I feel felt. Mm. You cannot okay. AI around feeling felt in the experience of someone telling you, you know, this person really manipulated me or really devalued me. And the feeling of somebody taking that in and saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And, and, and the other type of empathy is just cognitive. It's just pr processing the data and having the appropriate response. That is where it can be manipulative you know, it could be totally manipulative to get, to drive you in right. a certain direction. And AI is very capable of using that kind of empathy to drive you toward weight loss products, you know, purchasing things, whatever it is, but it is not the same as another human being. And I don't think we design our way around that feeling of someone else stepping into your experience and um feeling you and not literally though because that that could be a lawsuit i'm just kidding <laughs> no not literally <laughs> feeling you but this um, and it's it's something called mirror mirror neurons i love that with, cannot, with 
with you with you and today i feel felt um oh, good. <laughs> and bet's director of research and learning uh be above leadership um any interaction with you uh only only rises the tide uh as opposed to uh uh hanging uh hanging out in the salt mines below <laughs> lake michigan you see how i just tied it all together you did. I no ai that. can do that good no job. ai can do that um yeah, just uh tell us about uh but now i know your name so about a year or two ago, I started writing a blog on narcissism where I really wanted to process some of the things that I had learned. And there's probably like, I want to say there's a lot of blog entries. I was doing it daily for a while because I just needed to write some of my own stories, but also some of the science, some of the things that I was the examples. Um, and the reason I call it, but now I know your name is I knew in this relationship that I mentioned that I was in, I knew I didn't feel right, but I didn't know why. And once I figured out, because he was a type of narcissist, so there's the Donald Trump and Elon Musk type, look at me, I'm great. There's another main type that they call a covert narcissist where they act more like the victim. I didn't know that existed and so I couldn't figure out why I, this man who was supposed to be my soulmate was making me feel so bad. And then I figured, then I found it, covert narcissist, and, I, and but now I know your name. Now I know what's going on and my eyes are open and they'll never be closed again. Well, uh, on that note, uh, I can tell you uh, this has been, uh, I, was, I was looking at the time and I was like, where has the time gone? <laughs> Uh, this might be a record for longest. Really? Show. Um, well, you know what? I, I, I tell you, I try and keep it to an hour. I introduced two truths and a lie, but sometimes I just knew that uh, we were going to have an amazing conversation. And uh, whenever that book, Toxic Stew, is ready, <laughs> uh, you come back here first. I, I think I might have to write that. I'm going to take that. I love that. That's what I do. I come up with names for books. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who is not, I hope. Uh, a narcissist is Chuck Norris. You are Chuck Norris approved. <laughs> and, and we will be back soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for watching the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing with your host, multiple author, and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests, and much more, visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs> <laughs>